Hello and welcome back, or just welcome if you're new here. There are loads of videos of this type on the internet, but when I was pregnant and wanted to watch this type of video, the things said in the video didn't really resonate with me because I'm pretty granola. Like, kind of crunch. If you're unfamiliar with that terminology, what that means is I don't necessarily swim with the, the mainstream, the usual current. So today's video is a things that you need in pregnancy or pregnancy essentials, but the granola version. Just a disclaimer from my side, nothing in these videos is advice. This is not me trying to tell women what to do. These videos are for fun and maybe a little bit of value purposes, but please just take what serves you and leave what doesn't serve you. Then the other thing I want to say is I don't actually think you need anything in pregnancy. Like anything I'm going to mention in this video, I think it's nice to have. Like I don't really think that you need to go out and get anything. So like some of these things might be helpful, but like if you don't want to get anything then that's cool too. All right, last thing for the intro and then I'm going to just jump straight into the things. The reason I'm filming this currently not pregnant is because when I was pregnant, I was a little bit busy emigrating, so I didn't get around to making this content. So now I'm making it even though my little bump is already outside the bump. Oh. All right, let's get started with the first thing that I want to discuss. Oh. So one of the number one thing pregnant women hear, I think, is folic acid. For me, I didn't take folic acid. I did a lot of preconception prep. I have a video about that. I'll probably make an updated video on that. I never once took folic acid. The reason for that is that folic acid is the form that isn't the best form for the body to use. So I opted even when I wanted to supplement to take folate, which is the version that your body uses best, instead of folic acid. And I only did that when I wasn't eating folate rich foods. I'm mentioning this because it's like, oh, you're pregnant, you must take folic acid. And uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that. And also, Everything that I've read says that it is much more beneficial in preconception relative to pregnancy. Of course, folate is still important in pregnancy, but the high focus should actually be in preconception, not pregnancy. So nonetheless, in my pregnancy, I did for the first trimester when I wasn't eating folate rich foods, I would supplement a folate. For the remainder of my pregnancy, I just made sure to eat folate rich foods, which for me, uh, meant that I was eating liver and I know that that also is a controversial one and some people will be like no you can't eat liver because of vitamin A toxicity and so forth. I've linked down a video below where I discuss this and other conventional pregnancy <laughs> advice with someone who's way more informed about nutrition than I am and can explain it a lot better. We did a book discussion on the book Expecting Better and we address that amongst other things. Also a great book to really understand vitamin A and the requirements in pregnancy and all that is Real Food for Pregnancy by Lily Nichols. Okay, moving on. The other thing is loads of people will take a prenatal supplement. I did not do a prenatal supplement. I did whole foods, real foods with select supplementation and most of the time my supplements are also like real food type things like cod liver oil or bee pollen or some kind of desiccated organ. My interest in health and nutrition stretches as far as I want to be healthy and of course looking up health in terms of an infant. So therefore I rely on people with a greater expertise than I have. So I read up a lot but then I also refer to other people. So one of the things that I used instead of a prenatal was I did the course Conscious Conception. I've linked that down below. I did that in pre conception, I knew which real foods I wanted to focus on and I knew that when my diet was lacking in something, which are the things that I wanted to supplement and which are the things just because of general environment I choose to supplement and again, I have a strong preference for real food supplementation. All right, moving on. So one of the things that I think is a pregnancy need, I'm going to phrase in that way, but I've already said, I don't think that you need anything, but one of the really beneficial things in the first trimester I would say is and this is gonna sound a bit woohoo so bear with me is affirmations and meditation most of the time in social media we see oh my gosh I found out I was pregnant and then the person looks blissfully happy and that's not always how many women experience it so if you speak to women about their first trimester the first trimester can be a 
major roller coaster in terms of the physical things that you're going through, but also the emotional things that you're experiencing. Be it fears, fears around the fact that the first trimester is the riskiest part of a pregnancy. Fears around how's my life going to change? How am I going to prepare for this? How is work going to change for me if I'm working? I mean, having a baby is a major change to your life. So of course, there's just going to be so much floating around as well as excitement, as well as gratitude. But I just want to be realistic that those other things happen to a lot of people. And then you might also be feeling a little bit physically not so wonderful all the time. Because again, the first trimester is typically associated with some symptoms that aren't all that fun to experience. So I did not have morning sickness. I didn't have any major pregnancy <laughs> symptoms. I had a little bit of fatigue there for about two or three weeks towards the end of the first trimester. So I can't really speak about good tips for how to handle like the physical symptom stuff. But in terms of your mindset and your approach, I think that some affirmations and meditations are amazing. Some gratitude journaling when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel particularly great, or you've got loads of fears that are coming up, start the morning maybe with like a grounded meditation. And if you find yourself maybe spiraling again, bring yourself back. And I personally, even though I've been doing affirmations and meditations and all that for years, I still like to use guided meditations. Inside Timer is my favorite app for that. I use the free version, except when I'm traveling, in which case I get the paid version so that I can download the ones that I like. But super, super helpful, I think, to just have somebody else guide you to coming back to your body, connecting to your body, finding that grounded space, connecting to your baby and the changes that are happening and to just surrender to a beautiful process and to be able to fully immerse yourself in being pregnant because how amazing is being pregnant? All right, so then the second need. So other people in other videos might have sort of better things around like if you feel nauseous, do this. If you feel whatever, do that. The only pregnancy symptom I really had in my first trimester was fatigue. So the only thing that I did when I experienced fatigue is I listened to my body's call for rest and I rested. I slowed down as much as I could and just uh, took a lot of naps. Moving on to the second trimester. In the second trimester is typically where most people will start to expand. If you are already in the vibe of wearing nice flowy clothing, then this is not applicable to you. Even though I'm very granola, I still dress mostly in yoga tights and uh, some bamboo shirts. So I have about uh, four or five pairs of this exact outfit, which is why you see it in most of my videos. It is made of bamboo. I'm very particular about what touches my skin, but I wear tight tights. Because I wear tight tights, and I know, not the best for circulation, but I still enjoy wearing them, I needed to change my pants in the second trimester. So I shifted from the more work-looking tights to the ones that I'm currently wearing, which is the Booty Bamboo ah. Active ones. I'll link them down below. I think they're available in most countries. I'm not an affiliate, just a big fan. They were fine for most of my second trimester. But then by like the end of the second trimester, they started to get a little tight. And I was in Canadian winter, so I wanted some long pants. If I was in summer, I'm not a dress kind of person, but I think I would have just done nice flowy dresses. But anyway, I ended up buying two maternity tights and then I only liked the one, so I only wore the one. And it was great. It was honestly quite nice to have tights that could stretch over my bump. They were made of things I don't really like to purchase and have against my skin, but it was sort of like I'd put off doing it and then I urgently needed to have something to wear and then went to the nearest shop and bought them. So if you're watching this video and you are not already stretching all of your pants and you're a tights kind of person like me, I definitely recommend looking up like where can you get tights that are made of things that you are happy to put against your skin and maybe not fast fashion and just in preparation for when that time comes. Again, if you're somebody who doesn't wear tight clothes, I don't think that you need to buy maternity clothes. I did not buy any other maternity clothes other than those two pairs of tights because my shirts could fit over my bump and my winter coat and everything else could fit over my bump and anything that couldn't fit over my bump I didn't wear. If you're somebody who wears tight shirts, then you might need to go get something that can fit 
over your bump. Personally, from an environmental perspective, from a saving money perspective, from a not wanting clutter in my house perspective, I just am not a fan of maternity clothes in general, unless they're so wonderful that I'm going to wear them after pregnancy for breastfeeding, maybe nice and comfy. I really would buy something if I knew that I was gonna wear it outside of pregnancy, even though I hope to be pregnant a couple more times in my life, it's still not enough for me to just wear something in the pregnancy. So that's coming from someone who doesn't express myself creatively through what I wear. If creative expression through what you wear excites you, then obviously that's going to be different for you. Here's one I wasted money on. <laughs> Around 28 weeks, I got this hectic pain when I would be on my feet for some time. I don't even think it was that long, but anyway. I went into a panic assuming that I would have this pain my entire pregnancy and I bought a pregnant belly band. The pain only lasted like two weeks, so I only wore the belly band for like two weeks of my pregnancy and then it went away. I think my body just adjusted and I didn't need it anymore. That being said, I think that a belly band is nice support if you're experiencing that, just something to help kind of carry the bump when your body's adjusting because you grow big, like faster than your body can adjust. And although before I left South Africa, I did loads of work with a physio, she's awesome, to prepare my body, but through immigration, I wasn't keeping up with those practices. So I think in a future pregnancy, I will keep up with the practices in terms of making sure that I'm moving correctly and preparing for my body to carry that extra load. Given that I didn't, I got a belly band. I used it for two weeks. If you are experiencing pain, because we can't change what we didn't do, you know? So when it gets there and you're experiencing the pain, you really don't want to suffer the rest of your pregnancy going like, oh, wish I'd seen a physio sooner. If a belly band is supportive for you, I do recommend buy one on Facebook Marketplace because there might be people like me who barely wore theirs or borrow one from a friend. I currently don't even have mine because I gave it to somebody else to give it a try. So try get one from somebody else or buy one secondhand because I think I paid like $80 for something that I used for two weeks. Okay. Moving on from what I wasted money on to something I did not waste money on, but some other people think that they wasted money on this item. So it's really like a personal preference kind of thing. And that is my pregnancy pillow. That thing is bulky. It is huge. I got the U-shaped one because I wanted to be able to turn and then not need to turn the pillow. It really takes up a big part of the bed and we have a king size bed. It was so used. It was worth every cent. Towards the end of my pregnancy, it went everywhere with me. I dragged that thing downstairs when I wanted to sit downstairs and then back up for sleepy time. Uh, it brought me uh, so much comfort. I personally went for the U shape as I explained but some people will go for the C shape and one that I'm probably going to add into a future pregnancy is this kind of like wedge thing that you can wedge under your bump because I found that even though I was using the pregnancy pillow, great for my knees, great for hugging it, I still wanted something that would lift the bump and the pregnancy pillow was too high for me to kind of perfectly slot under my bump. So a nice one to wedge under there and my pregnancy pillow. I, even though it's really bulky and I like to declutter or get rid of things if I'm not gonna use them again, I kept my pregnancy pillow because I will use it again and the secondhand market for selling them is quite saturated, so it's not like I'm gonna get a lot for selling it and I'm just gonna buy it again in a future pregnancy. Even though we're big on child spacing, so that will be way into the future. But for now, it is vacuum sealed up and in a closet for future use. So this one, I really can't say whether it's gonna work for everybody because I know loads of people are like, no, biggest waste of money ever. It's so bulky, it takes up most of the bed. I loved it, worth every cent for me. That was my second most used thing in pregnancy. The most used thing for me in pregnancy was Epsom salts. I'm a big fan of soaking in the bath. I have been for like most of my life and particularly in pregnancy. I loved to lie in the bath and feel baby movements from around their 16 weeks or so and connect to my body, relax after the day. And as I got bigger, it was really comforting for my body. And all of my baths were an Epsom salt soak. I carried that practice through my first 40 days after birth. So Epsom salts is really very frequently used by me. Not so much anymore. <laughs> Don't have time to soak now but during pregnancy it was something that i really did for me after a long day and to connect to my body and my baby also a great source of magnesium 
Moving on and staying on the personal care topic. Loads of these videos, I think. I don't actually know if I watch that many. The few videos that I watched all recommend some kind of cream to prevent stretch marks or lotion or something. I don't really subscribe to that. I believe that stretch marks are more indicative of how elastic our skin is versus what kind of lotion we're using. So I don't think that if you have a very inelastic skin and you use like the best anti-stretch mark lotion, if there's even such a thing, then you are not going to get stretch marks. I think it's much more a function of how elastic our skin is, which is much more a function of our nutrition and a little bit of, I guess, genetics. My other qualm with sort of anti-stretch mark lotions is that I am very concerned about what we're putting on the belly given that the belly is right by our baby. I mean, of course, anywhere in your skin really we need to be concerned, but in particular, like right by the baby. And for me, I would not risk some of the ingredients in some of those products being so close to my baby in the hopes that I might not get stretch marks. Like I'd rather get stretch marks than use those ingredients on my belly. Maybe that's easy for me to say given that I have a very sort of oily skin and I'm not particularly prone to stretch marks. But moving to Canada, Calgary, Canada, it is very dry here compared to what I'm used to. So even me with a very oily skin dried out when we moved here. So if my skin was itchy from being dry or uncomfortable, oh. that didn't really happen much, but there was like once or twice, maybe three times, that I felt that I wanted to put something on my skin because it was feeling a bit dry. In that case, I used a organic jojoba oil with literally nothing else. My preferred oil for my body is tallow. I did have a tallow that I got later in the pregnancy that I used on other parts of my body but I don't remember putting it on my belly per se and the main reason for that is a lot of tallow products because nobody wants to smell beefy comes with essential oils in it and I didn't want to use any essential oils on my body during pregnancy just because there's such a high concentration I'm sure loads of people might disagree with me on that and that's fine I think it's great that we're all making our own choices in pregnancy I just feel like I don't know enough about what such a high concentration of a plant does during pregnancy and I would rather err on the side of caution of no. So because organic jojoba was the easiest for me to find to use on my body that didn't have anything in it, under normal circumstances and after Elba was born, I did source a tallow that is made with infused flowers instead of essential oils. So if ever, which is not frequent, I need to use a moisturizer on Elba or myself. That is my preferred one. Anyway, I didn't get stretch marks, but I'm definitely not going to say that it's because I used organic jojoba oil and or tallow. I just think that sometimes if your skin does get itchy and you do want something to moisturize, sharing that those are the two that I used might be valuable for someone. Next one. This one has to do with nesting and preparing. So while loads of people in their end of second trimester start of third trimester would be running out buying baby stuff I was just piling up more and more birth books birth resources doing workshops on that baby books and equipping myself with knowledge the reason I did that as opposed to running out and buying stuff is I don't live in the jungle Unfortunately, that would be very cool. I live in a city where I have next day delivery and shops that are very close to me. So whatever thing I needed for baby, I'd be able to get that really quickly. What I knew I wouldn't be able to do very quickly in postpartum is accumulate knowledge and information because I was going to be adjusting to parenthood and I, from everything that I'd read and spoken to people, it's not really a time in your life where you are wanting to accumulate more information other than the massive accumulation of information you're having through the experience of having had a baby and bonding and connecting and getting to know your baby. <laughs> anyway, so people did say to me like, there's ideals and then there's what happens with your baby and all that. Like, I, again, that's, that's not my experience. So what I did was read books about birth. I listened to loads of birth stories. I listened to Ina May's Guide to Childbirth with my husband on Audible. The first part of that book is just birth stories. So that was amazing for him 
and I to listen together for him to really hear these accounts of women and different experiences of birth because you know that's what we were going to be experiencing. I read breastfeeding book and I made little sticky notes so that if I want to re-refer to it, which I did, I'm crazy helpful, and books about sort of infant sleep and I didn't read the one that I recommend now the most in pregnancy. In pregnancy I read, I did it postpartum but nonetheless I did read about infant sleep and all the other stuff in pregnancy and go diaper free for elimination communication. All that stuff I did in pregnancy because I knew that once I'd had my baby I was not going to want to learn that information but I was going to want to have that information. So I made loads of sticky notes and had my resources and knew exactly where I wanted to look when something came about. And even though some people might think that that's not helpful and you deal with the scenario when it comes up, it was incredibly helpful for me and it also helped other women through that who hadn't done that reading but who knew that I did so they'd message me and be like, hey, I haven't finished this book. I know that you read it. Can you send me a picture of what to do when this happens? I felt so comfortable with my breastfeeding journey because I'd read a breastfeeding book in pregnancy. I will shout it from the rooftop that it was incredibly valuable for me in pregnancy to equip myself with knowledge and information about the things that were important to me for postpartum and for birth and for baby. I will link down below my most recommended books and the ones that I thought were the most valuable either be it for birth or for postpartum or for baby. Anyway, that kind of ties in with the next one is if you're a little granola, that means you are doing things a little bit differently. Even if you're just like slightly granola, like you don't even have to be very granola. Like I'm pretty, pretty far on the granola scale, but like even if you're just a little bit, that means when you're having conversations with other pregnant people, you might be wanting to do something very differently to how they do it. And that might be a challenge in pregnancy, or at least it was for me. So I've been a little crunch for a long time and I'm quite used to that. But in pregnancy, it's quite a beautiful, vulnerable experience because you're going through this transition that it isn't all that nice to constantly hear opinions that are very different from what you're planning on doing. And there was this longing that I had to connect with women who had similar values and similar things that they wanted to do with their birth and their baby. And it was really, really vital almost to my experience there towards the end as I was preparing for birth to be able to speak to women who loved their birthing process, who believed in the importance of the ritual of birth and who could just share their wisdom with me or people who hadn't yet experienced it but are on the similar train who were interested in the preparation I was doing and interested in the very many questions that come up and the very many decisions that come up and navigating the sort of if you're going to get somebody to assist your birth if you're not doing a free birth. I emigrated in pregnancy so I did use a registered midwife and there's a lot of things you want to navigate there. What I do believe makes a major difference in pregnancy is having a community of people who share some of the values that you have and some of the decisions that you want to take. So for me that looked like a bunch of friends and other people that I had met online through social media as well as getting a doula who shared my approach. And I'm back. That recommendation is around establishing a community, a tribe, a village, but people who share your outlook. If you are preparing for a home birth, you will probably receive loads of comments that are, of course, compassionate comments from a space of being concerned for you or for your baby. And sometimes those comments are not always the easiest to hear. So it really helps if you've got a community of people who share your approach to be calm and grounded in the face of people who don't necessarily share your approach. I also found it particularly valuable to discuss other women's birthing experiences with them, especially women who opted to have unmedicated births because that isn't as common these days as it used to be. So I did bombard my mom with questions and to whatever extent my grandmothers were open for discussing their births. I also wanted to hear about their births just because that was what I was preparing for. And it was valuable to me to hold on to the fact that that used to be so common and so many women have done it, so I can do it. And to really find that courage within me to be excited and not overly worried about the major emphasis that's put on birth around pain. Anyway, I found that helpful, let's move on. This one is, let's see, I'm gonna share that I did it. You can share what your opinion is because I think some people who are granola think that this is unnatural and therefore don't wanna do it. And I completely see that point. And that is colostrum expression in pregnancy. Now I opted to do it. And my reason for that is 
I'm in agreement that is a tad bit unnatural, but given the high prevalence in modern society of birth interventions and most birth interventions have a high chance of impacting the breastfeeding journey. Now I wanted to be realistic about all that stuff. As much as I prepared for my unmedicated peaceful home birth and wanted everything to go perfectly, I also wanted to be realistic that birth interventions are very common and that there's a high chance that they would then impact on the breastfeeding journey. And breastfeeding for me was more important than it was to not do something unnatural in pregnancy, to put it that way. It's sort of a weird crude way to phrase it. But anyway, what I mean by that is I did not want to supplement my baby with formula. I didn't know friends at the time who I think would have been comfortable if I was like, hey, could you loan me some of your milk if I needed it? And I had just moved to a new country, so I don't even know where to get donor milk. And all of that stuff would have been very, I think, difficult to acquire if there was a situation where there was birth interventions and now baby needs something. So I did not want to supplement with anything other than breast milk and I ideally wanted it to be mine, which is why just to mitigate against any risks and take a bit of pressure off of the establishing of a breastfeeding journey, I decided to express colostrum in pregnancy and to keep that in our freezer just in case. I started doing it at 37 weeks. Some people say that it induces labor. In my case, it did not induce labor. Elba was born at 40 weeks and six days and I did it every day from 37 weeks onwards. The recommendation of when to start might differ depending on who you speak to. My practitioners, my midwives said from 37 weeks. We hand expressed colostrum Specifically, my husband did it for me, and I believe that that was a really beautiful connecting act in the final weeks of pregnancy. Like, both of us really found that to be very special. At the end of the day, sit down and express some colostrum into a cup, see how much we got, put it into a syringe, label it, put it in the fridge, next day put it in the freezer. We used a combination of feeding syringes and the silicone Haka colostrum expression storage things. The Haka ones, of course, my preference would be silicone over typical plastic, but we were expressing so much and the Haka ones are pretty pricey that we ended up just using the feeding syringes. And the feeding syringes are like way, 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 way cheaper. And also they turn out to be like a little nicer to use, a little easier. And that's only from the expression part. So because we didn't thankfully need to supplement with colostrum, I didn't end up using our stash. I probably should do something with it. Uh, it's just there. It's a, it's a pretty big stash. But I didn't end up using it so I can't tell you whether the Hakka ones are nice for when you are using it. But what I will say for the expression part, it was the easiest to do it into like a little measuring cup and then to pull it into the syringe. For some people, I'm just gonna add this in there, if you only get a little bit, which you do in the beginning, I think for most people, then you don't really fill up much of a syringe. Our preference for syringes was in the beginning, because you're not getting that much, was like one milliliter and then three milliliters and then five milliliters and then we went like up to, I think 15 or 20 milliliters. You can mix colostrum as long as it's at the same temperature so if you and you can keep it in the fridge for a few few days like i think three days so you can express today and tomorrow refrigerate those two mix them when they're both cold and put them in the freezer if you're not getting enough in one expression session so yeah if you want more information on other things i did to prepare for breastfeeding let me know in the comments below i don't want to waffle on about that too much but i'm saying all this information while saying i get that it is a bit of an unnatural one and maybe loads of granola people will be like no that's not for me i don't want to mess with the natural process i hear you my decision was purely based off of that i wanted some pressure off of establishing breastfeeding if there was anything that hindered that and just to know that i had something to feed my baby if there were some birth interventions or something that was required and that gave me some peace of mind. So even though I'm on the same natural train and completely 
get that reasoning this is a practice that i will probably do in future pregnancies as well i also think that colostrum is really <laughs> nutritious so it can be added to other stuff later a few people who did this said that they would add it to like their older kids smoothies and things when they didn't need to use it for their baby i think we used it on alba's skin a few times but i i, I sort of just kind of forgot that's why we haven't really used it and thankfully we didn't need it okay now i'm just gonna ramble off some nice to have before we finish up this video one a pregnancy physio i did two weeks of pregnancy physio before i moved from south africa to canada it was just incredibly helpful in terms of my body in terms of preparing for birth and that is something that i will i had to cram it in because we were emigrating but in future pregnancies i will do it much more spread out and i hope not to be emigrating in a future pregnancy so that i can have a greater focus on that then a pelvic floor physio if you haven't already done that in preconception or if you've done it in preconception also want to do it in pregnancy i did it at the beginning of my pregnancy but i had already done it in preconception just a strong focus on the pelvic floor area and then i went for an evaluation afterwards as well maybe you don't want to see a pelvic floor physio you just want to see somebody who knowledgeable about the pelvic floor in general because that part of your body is going to be doing a lot and then it might need a little TLC after birth okay then uh, prenatal classes this one loads of people be like no I don't want to go I don't want to hear somebody else tell me what to do I'll just like read up and so forth I'm crazy nerdy so that's me like loads of books but the reason I went was one a structured class to go to with my husband because uh, he didn't necessarily have the time to read all of the content that I wanted him to read because he was busy with other stuff but he did read most of that book the the birth partner anyway so we went to prenatal classes and I think this is awesome even if you don't move to a new country it's in terms of being around other pregnant people that are birthing more or less the same time as you is really nice towards the end there to just share in that journey so we went to one that was seven weeks and then it included like a reunion class afterwards which i think is a big thing to check if yours does because you do want to formulate relationships where honestly in pregnancy most people are tired and preparing and all that so they're kind of not really focused on no no, no chit chat that much where you definitely bond more when the course is done so you do want one when there's like a reunion course Anyway, we did one that was seven weeks long. We met wonderful people in that course. And I would definitely recommend finding a community through some kind of course. And then comfortable pajamas. I basically lived in pajamas towards the end. And for me, our shipping from South Africa was delayed and I put ah. all of my summer pajamas in our shipping because I didn't think that I would need it. But I ran really hot in pregnancy and wanted to only sleep in shorts. So I ended up wearing my husband's boxers at the end of pregnancy to have comfortable little shorts to sleep in. So I would recommend just make sure you got some comfy PJs to sleep in. And then if you're comfortable to free boob it, then free boob it as your boobs are growing and want to be free and comfortable. Or just make sure that you do have comfortable, <laughs> nice stretchy bras. Uh, my bamboo booty ones were great throughout pregnancy. And I still wear them even now as breastfeeding bras because they're kind of sports bra-y and I just pull them up. I did buy like breastfeeding bras and then I don't like them so I just still use the same ones. I will link them down below in case you like them. Again, non-affiliate, just a fan. Right, then I want to end off with like a purchase that is not granola at all. It was actually like my most conventional purchase. Like I said, Canada winter in my pregnancy. I bought snow slippers. Now, when I went to go buy them, they only had a size bigger than the size shoe I typically am. Now, under normal circumstances, I wear only Vivo barefoot shoes. I only wear zero drop shoes with a wide toe box. I don't wear normal shoes anymore and I haven't for years. I did, however, want some kind of slipper thing to just like quickly run out and if I wanted to get the post. So I bought these like super mainstream snow slippers. And can I just tell you, the best purchase ever. They were so comfortable as my feet swelled, even though they were a size too big. The size too big ended up being a blessing. I wore them every single day when we went out. I didn't care about being fashion-y. I cared about the comfort. And in Canada, you take your shoes off when you go into somebody's house. When you have a huge bump, that isn't all that fun to do. So these snow slippers, I think they're from like North Face or something. 
worth it. Like, I know that they're fast fashion and they're made of plastic and all the things that I don't usually purchase, but wow, I use them a lot. And coming up on winter, we'll see if I use them again. <laughs> but in pregnancy, honestly, it was really nice to not have to bend down for laces or anything to just be able to slip my foot in and go. So although that purchase is like not great in terms of my sustainability values, I do believe that being comfortable in your pregnancy is important. And that made a big difference to my comfort levels. And that brings us to the end of the video. Like I said, I don't think that you need any of these things. I think they are nice to have, nice to do's, etc. And I hope that you maybe found some of them interesting or valuable. Let me know if you've got anything in your pregnancy that's been like life changing or if there's any of these that you disagree with. I would love to hear from you in the comment section down below. I will be making some more pregnancy content, I think, if I have more to talk about in pregnancy before I move on to birth content content, breastfeeding content, and the rest of my parenting journey. Anyway, if you like this video, please remember to like this video, and if you want to see more of my content, please remember to subscribe to my channel.